All right. Uh, good night. Uh, this is uh, June 20th, uh, 2019. Um, hope everyone's doing well. I hope everyone's safe. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the country, but here in uh, the low country of South Carolina, we're getting a lot of bad weather. Um, so a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, kind of, you know, uh, noise and stuff going on in the background if you hear it. And also, you know, I'm worried about the Wi-Fi, obviously, but uh, we'll keep this going as long as we can. Um, I also want to uh, tell everyone that I, you know, I hope everyone's going well health wise, you know, emotionally, all that stuff. Um, I know this could probably be a tough time of year for a lot of, especially parents, their kids are uh, out of school, things like that. So I'm hoping everyone's doing well. Um, and uh, I got some, I guess, good news. I've been having one issue since my transplant. I just haven't been sleeping well and I got diagnosed with sleep apnea. So hopefully I'm going to get some relief from that soon. Every other than that, I'm feeling great. Uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about diabetes and, and, uh, those of you that are familiar with the disease know that there's so much we can talk about. So I'm going to touch on what I can tonight and I'll probably have a follow-up episode a little bit later. Uh, but, but, um, um, tonight on, uh, um, uh, editorial edition or editorial or kidney edition editorial. Uh, why can't I remember the name? Anyway, tonight on my show, we're going to talk about diabetes. Uh, diabetes is the largest cause of kidney disease in the U.S. Um, I'm going to give a lot of more statistics later, but uh, but that's just kind of a starting off point. Um, we're, we're talking about kidney disease a lot in, um, in our network and on my show. Um, and so I just want you to know that diabetes is the lighting cause of uh, kidney disease. Uh, I'm going to tell a little bit about my own story because um, one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I have a personal attachment to, to this subject. Uh, not only am I diabetic, but a, a couple of years before me, my twin brother was um, uh, made a diabetic also, or was diagnosed with diabetes also. I was telling Steve a little while ago, my brother actually went to an eye doctor and and he told him to get his blood sugar checked. And when he got his checked, it was 755. Um, the, the doctor was actually um, kind of surprised that he wasn't blind. Uh, mine, I, as I said, I was diagnosed a few years later, a year and a half later or so. Um, I was, I don't know, 19, 19 and a half. Um, and um, I was in college and um, I knew the signs of diabetes from my brother. Things like, you know, cotton mouth, frequent urination, um, uh, feeling lethargic, things like that. And so I went to the doctor myself and said, hey, I have diabetes. You need to check me. He checked me and, uh, uh, and uh, diagnosed me immediately. Um, when my brother was diagnosed, uh, he was actually kept in the hospital a couple of days just so they could educate him on the disease. On mine, I went straight to an endocrinologist and within, you know, an hour and a half, I, you know, had been prescribed insulin and told a little bit about disease. So there wasn't a tremendous amount of education. Uh, definitely not going to use that as an excuse because I was uh, 19, 20 years old and I, I uh, thought I knew everything and I thought I was invincible as we all do at that age. And so I didn't think anything would ever affect me. So I pretty much didn't take care of it at all. Um, I, you know, once I ran out of my first supply of insulin, I kind of stopped taking it. I was, you know, eating fast food at least once a day, at least once a day. Um, I was weighing probably, I don't know, 300, 315 pounds at the time. Um, you know, very little exercise. Um, you know, uh, I was in marching band in college, so I got exercise there. But other than that, there wasn't any additional exercise. Um, and I just thought I'd never, I would never uh, be affected by it. I mean, come on, you know, I didn't, no one in my family had diabetes other than my brother, that kind of thing. So I uh, just kind of ignored it a little bit. Um, which obviously, uh, you know, my body couldn't ignore it. Um, and by about, I'll say 26, 27, I started having some issues with my eyes. Um, the first time was in my left eye. I had, um, what's called diabetic retinopathy. And basically what that is, is the blood vessels in your eyes start bursting and, um, you see blood. Um, there, uh, there's two ways to, um, fix it. Or, or one's a Band-Aid, one's, I guess, uh, at least a temporary fix. Uh, one is to get shots in your eyes. Um, probably in each of my eyes, I've had over 20 shots um, directly in them. And what that does is it restricts the blood vessels. That way, they're not leaking blood. Um, and then um, the next thing uh, is, is um, what's called a cauterization surgery, where they basically cauterize the blood vessels, and that stops the leak also. So I had that successful surgery in my left eye, and then, uh, and then I started having problems in my right eye. Uh, the problem with my right eye is I didn't have insurance to pay for the surgery. And so we did shots a few times, and then uh, next thing you know, 
we are, uh, we, we, I need the surgery. And I, and I apparently waited too long to get the surgery because I ended up having it, but it didn't correct my vision. So currently because of diabetes, I'm blind in my right eye. Uh, and I wish I could say that's the worst health problems I've had, um, in my, uh, diabetes, uh, history. I also have a disease called gastroparesis. Uh, uh, gastroparesis is a fairly common disease in, uh, diabetics that haven't controlled their diabetes. And, uh, the big reason why it, what, what the big, what it happens is, um, with, and you see people have this with their feet and, and have to get legs amputated and feet amputated, toes amputated, that kind of thing is you start losing feeling in your limbs. Well, um, gastroparesis is where you start, the nerves stop, stop telling your stomach to digest, um, which is, it, it's probably the worst thing I've gone through. Um, even worse than my kidney disease, to be honest, um, what, what happens with gastroparesis is the food just sits in your stomach and, and when it sits in your stomach, um, eventually your body's like, this shouldn't be here. And so it has to get rid of it and you end up regurgitating. And when I say regurgitating, I, I think in, um, probably 2016, 2017, I probably, um, average throwing up, uh, I don't know, six, seven times a day, um, uh, every single day. Um, there were days where I literally couldn't take a sip of water without, without getting sick. Uh, the hospital here at MUSC, I think I spent three quarters of 2017 in it. Um, uh, they added a feeding tube. I was so sick that I threw up the feeding tube, which the doctors had never seen. So they took it out because they realized it wasn't going to do any good. Um, and I was going through dialysis at the time. And, and I mean, I, I would have to leave dialysis regularly just because I couldn't sit there. I was just so sick. Uh, it was, uh, it was pretty incredible. Um, and, and then, uh, about a year and a half before I got my transplant, I got implanted with a gastric pacemaker. Lots of people don't know about it because there's not many people that do it in South Carolina. There's only one doctor that was doing it. And I think he retired. And when I got it at first, it didn't work. Um, the doctor did tell me it could take a year, year and a half for it to really start working. But I was really frustrated because I was hoping for some relief and I didn't get it. Um, eventually, um, and I don't know if it's because, um, I, I don't know if it's exactly just because of the pacemaker, uh, but uh, it seems to have caused a big difference. And and I stopped throwing up. Uh, why that's a good thing is because, or stop throwing up as much. It still happens from time to time. Why that's a good thing is because I wouldn't have been able to get a kidney transplant if I didn't have that improvement. Um, and and uh, because they would, they were very worried about me being able to keep down the medicine, uh, which is definitely obviously a a, um, a great uh, a great point. Um, but but luckily it turned around. I was able to do it. I was able to go to dialysis. Um, you know, full time, you know, that kind of thing like I was supposed to, that was after being switched from peritoneal because they were hoping that would help my stomach. Um, and then there was even a point where I went off of hemodialysis for a little while because they thought dialysis was making me sick. And oddly enough, my most improvement was when I was off dialysis. Um, so there might've been a little bit something to that theory also, uh, but it got to the point where I had to go back on dialysis. So, um, so, and, and obviously the diabetes left, you know, not taking care of your diabetes led to my kidney disease, which uh, progressed pretty fast. And um, and it obviously caused me my other habits that caused the diabetes. Uh, I, and obviously, I was diagnosed with type two. We'll talk about the different the two different types right now um, or in a little while. Um, next thing you know, um, I uh, I had hypertension and diabetes, the two major causes of kidney failure. So so, um, you know, I was a poster boy for somebody that didn't do what he was supposed to and had to learn the tough way how to live life in order to, to, to be healthy or healthier. How about this? The healthiest Kenneth I can be. Um, and so, so, you know, this is a, this is the big reason I'm passionate about this, um, because there's so many people that are suffering from this and it's such a debilitating disease. Um, and, um, and we'll talk about statistics more, but, uh, but it is also one of the um, one of the uh, you know biggest causes of death in the United States. It's the it's uh, around the seventh leading cause of death in the United States right now, and that's just um, uh, people that either died directly from diabetes on their death certificate or people that are, have an underlying cause of diabetes. Um, so so you know, and that's the seventh leading cause. That doesn't include people that weren't diagnosed and things like that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so I want to talk a little bit before I move on to, to the current status and, and, 
And uh, before my transplant, um, I had been off diabetes medicine uh, for a little while when I was on uh, on dialysis because I I just really wasn't keeping it down for it to affect uh, my diabetes. Um, it wasn't because of diet and exercise. Then around December, it had spiked. My A1C was back up to 8.7. So I started taking, um, uh, I think it was glipizide again for a little while. And then eventually I switched to um, a couple other medicines. Um, but um, my, my A1C was around 8.7. Um, so uh, that was bad. And then I had gotten it under control before my transplant. And then um, with the prednisone, I went back up in, in uh, blood sugar uh, quite high. And so I went back on a good amount of insulin and things like that. Uh, so I just had my A1C checked uh, the other day and um, it was actually 5.4. So I, I, I don't have it perfect, but I, it's it, those are definitely uh, normal numbers. Uh, my doctor joked that he his is 5.3 and he's not diabetic at all. Uh, what that's I've had to do in order to keep that is is pretty much exercise every day and then eat. Um, I mean, I, I kind of try to avoid carbs. I can't say I do completely because that's impossible, but, but, um, uh, or it's impossible for me at least. Uh, but I've done a lot of work to try to avoid carbs because I want my blood sugar to be low. I, I got the second chance at life and I'm not going to let diabetes take my other kidney or my one good eye or my feet, my legs, things like that. So, so, um, you know, it takes a lot of work to not do it, but, or to not do the things that you used to, but, you know, um, you know, what, I think there's a famous quote that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Um, and so I'm done doing the same thing over. I need to do something to expect a better result. So, um, so let's talk now a little bit. I like doing this because I'm big kind of history buff. Uh, let's look a little bit at the history of diabetes. Um, the first kind of recorded, uh, recording of like symptoms and things that uh, of diabetes actually, it surprised me. It was about 3000 years ago in ancient Egypt. Um, there wasn't a name for it, things like that, but they had, um, uh, they had, they saw some of the signs and also, um, also, uh, they could tell something was wrong with the blood and urine. Uh, they weren't sure what yet, but they could tell something was wrong. Um, the word diabetes was first used by a guy named Aretas, Aretas uh, in about 81 AD. So that's the first time we hear the word diabetes. Uh, um, and, uh, the, and the word metalis, uh, which was added in 1675 by a British doctor named Thomas Willis. Uh, metalis means sweet honey. And it's odd because the reason it was named with that is because um, uh, the blood and urine tasted sweet. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, I guess before they had all these tests we had, they had to do something like taste urine or blood. Uh, so, but that was in 1675. Um, in 1757, a guy named Dobson, another British doctor, established what diabetes today by actually finding sugar in blood and urine. So, so he knew that there were higher levels of sugar, and he was able to test that, and that's how um, we kind of diagnosed the the current um, diabetes. Um, uh, in 1857, Claude, Claude Bernard, a uh, French doctor, found a small connection between liver and high blood sugar, which is interesting because we don't really think of the liver having much effect, but I guess it does have a little effect. Um, then in 1889, the role of the pancreas was discovered by two Austrian scientists named Meering and Minkowski, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, and um, and so they discovered that the pancreas, which is, you know, obviously what we know of today as the, the major cause of diabetes. Um, and then in 1921, um, uh, Banting and Best, who were uh, Canadian scientists, discovered uh, the initial basis for insulin. Um, I think I talked about this on my, uh, not last one, but my second to last um, show. Uh, what's interesting is those two men, because they wanted insulin to be universally available to people, sold the patent for a dollar. Um, so that, it's pretty crazy that, um, that they were, they did it, they were that generous and did something that generous. And, uh, today we see that that had no good on the cost of what insulin was. So, um, the first orally taken medicine uh, for diabetes was put out in 1955. And so, um, we've obviously had lots of advancements since then, but, uh, but the first, uh, oral medication for diabetes was in 19, in 1955. Um, uh, now what I want to do is talk a little bit about statistics on diabetes. Um, uh, so we, we talk a lot about the disease, um, 
And uh, it's obviously become more prevalent as our diets have gotten worse in the United States and in the world in general, um, particularly now um, China, India, you know, things, countries like that that are um, very much developing and becoming more, I guess, U.S. like in their eating habits. So so let's talk a little bit about statistics and, and all these statistics are going to be U.S. statistics um, um, just so. Uh, just so I'm clear, um, it, the, the statistics aren't as obvious. And to be honest, they're not as horrible as they are in the United States. So an estimated number of di- uh, the estimated number of diabetics in this country are 30.1 million people. Uh, uh, and there's also about 84.1 million that are pre-diabetics. Um, pre-diabetes is people that due to usually weight, diet, and exercise, they're very prone to getting diabetes within the next five years. So so theoretically, that number from 30 million could go as high as 100 million in, in the next five years. So so that's that's pretty crazy to think of. Uh, Native Americans and Native Alaskans have the highest percentage at about 15 percent. Um, Non-Hispanic blacks are next at 12.7 percent. Um, Non-Hispanic whites had the lowest at 7.4 percent. Um, so as you can see, it's way more prevalent in the African American community than it is in the uh, Caucasian community, um, and we'll talk a little bit about maybe why in a little while. Uh, and so, uh, the next thing we'll talk about is education level, and this kind of interests me. I, I, I guess I knew this, but um, it was interesting to actually read it. Uh, people that had not graduated from high school um, had the highest percent at twelve point six percent. People that just got a high school diploma are at 9.5, and by just, I mean high school diploma is an important goal, but um, are at 9.5%. And then people that have post-high school education are only at 7.2%. Um, so um, I, I was talking to someone earlier about, think about this, like, you know, some of the systemic uh, racism and, and things like that that we've had in this country has has caused people other than, I'll say, whites to have a higher percentage. If you think um, you know, the education level in, in, um, in, I guess, poor communities and, and pro- predominantly uh, people of color uh, is less because of the systemic racism that's, you know, been in the country since its, its founding. Uh, and, and so what it's done is it's not only put these pe- the people at disadvantages for, you know, income, education, things like that, but it's also put them in danger and health. Um, so it's pretty uh, it's pretty crazy to think about the the number of people that um, that as, as we talked about as I think I've seen Steve post nine out of ten African Americans are you know have some form of kidney disease they just don't a lot of them just don't know it yet and uh, a lot of that probably has to do with diabetes and hypertension so um, so it's interesting to see that you know the 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 numbers actually pan out to show that these issues are. Um, are very prevalent in those communities, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I was also surprised that Mexican Americans have a very high um, number, like of the Hispanic group. Theirs is um, theirs is about fifteen percent. Um, so, so uh, Mexican Americans have a tendency to be very, um, you know, have be at very high risk for diabetes. Also, um, so um, to pan out the numbers a little further, um, uh, about one point two five million people have type one diabetes. Uh, which in the next 30 years is supposed to go up to 5 million. What's interesting about that is, you know, type 1 diabetes you're born with. Um, and so it's interesting to me that why is that going to go up? Um, uh, and I, I think it has to do with the amount of processed foods and things like that and maybe chemicals and things that we're ingesting uh, without knowing it. Uh, but but that number is supposed to grow a good bit, um, you know, you know, in the next uh, 30 years also. Uh, there are about 29 million type 2 diabetics, uh, which I think that number is low, uh, but that's diagnosed cases. So we also have those 84.1 million that are pre-diabetics, which would end up being type 2 also. Um, type What type 1 diabetes is, is where your pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin to combat, you know, carbo- carbohydrates and sugars. Um, a, a lot of times... Um, a lot of times those are diagnosed at very young. They also call it juvenile diabetes for that reason. I'm not saying you can't be diagnosed earlier, but usually it's because you've ignored symptoms prior to that, uh, which is very easy to do. Uh, lots of people ignore them all the time. Uh, type, of du- type 2 diabetes is where because of diet and exercise, for the most part, there's obviously exceptions, 
your pancreas produces ineffective insulin. Therefore, it can't keep up with the insulin, your insulin, insulin needs. And that's why you take things uh, in order to, um, uh, and that's why you take things um, like, you know, glipizide, metformin, or, or you know, insulin, or uh, Trulicity, uh, you know, those kind of things. Because um, what uh, I know tr- Trulicity in particular does is it kind of tries to trick your pancreas into producing more insulin. Um, so, uh, so that's what it's trying to do there. Um, uh, diabetes or diabetes related death, as I said, is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. About 250,000 people list diabetes is listed as a cause on their death certificate or underlying cause of death on their certificate of diabetes. There are about 1.5 million new cases of diabetes a year too. So that number is going to go down. That number is not going to go any down, down anytime soon. Um, I will say reading some stuff on the CDC, uh, they do feel, um, I guess, excited that some of the diabetes management that's been put out, um, whether it be you know going to see endocrinologists, taking medicine, things like that, seems to have helped a little bit better with the people that have diabetes. Uh, the problem is, I don't think, or I don't think they think that the amount of diabetics is going to decrease. Uh, the other thing about people that have died from it, they also feel about 20 to 30 percent of, of people probably have some sort of um, diabetes related, I guess, at least contributor to their death, like an underlying cause, but most of them do not know they have it. Um, so, uh, so it's not listed as a disease they have. Um, and so, so the number of people that die from diabetes a year is probably a good bit higher, um, but there's just no real way to know for sure. Um, you know, what, um, what actually, what the actual number is. Uh, so, so I think that's interesting. Um, Let's talk a tad about um, a, a little bit about cures and prevention. Um, so I've talked about the high con- con- concentration of kidney disease in the South. Um, and the same, as I said, is for hypertension, too. Uh, one of the big reasons the South is so prevalent with it is because of very poor diet and exercise. The South has always been known for good food, but it's very much a fried food based culture. Um, we all know that sweets are bad for diabetics, but I find a huge problem is actually carbohydrates. Um, I'm not going to advocate one diet in particular, but I will say that if you limit the amount of sugar and carbohydrates you have, I'm not saying cut them out. I'm just saying limit them. Um, it'll probably help you either avoid diabetes or control if if you have it. Um, uh, obviously, um, it's pretty, it's, it's so prevalent in the South. If you look at a map of you know, the concentrated diabetes, you know, you'll see a state like California and there's very little diabetes in California. You see a state like Mississippi and it's extremely high. Um, and I think that's a lot of social economic and education, um, based too. Um, because Mississippi, you know, I'm in the 49th worst state in education, Mississippi is the 50th. So, um, so I definitely think that, uh, you know, socioeconomic and, um, and education is a huge factor all through the South, but I used Mississippi, Mississippi as an example. Um, I'm lucky South Carolina has a lot of diabetes, but it's not as bad as a lot of the rest of the South. Um, so, uh, so, you know, there's one point for South Carolina, I guess. So, so, um, you know, um, and, and when it comes to, you know, we don't need to just worry about eating. The, the other big thing is exercise. And I'm not saying you have to be an Olympian or a marathon runner, but you know, even if you get out and walk a few times a week, any exercise you get is going to contribute to your, you having a less of a risk to have diabetes. Um, and, um, I know it's hard. A lot of people work long hours, things like that, but you know, I don't know, take the dog for a walk for a half hour or something like that. And you end up feeling better. And, um, and you also get to, you know, um, hopefully kind of avoid, you know, one of the worst diseases, uh, we have in this, in this country. Um, you know, um, the uh, type one, you know, most of those tips I gave are, are almost all of them are for type two type one. It definitely can help you to do those things. Uh, but type one, it's definitely taking your insulin, checking your blood sugar, those kind of things. Um, uh, some people have insulin pumps to help out with that, those kind of things. But I think, um, uh, most of those tips will be very helpful for type two. Um, and, um, and, uh, so, so, uh, with type two also, there's a lot of choices. Obviously there's the oral medication, um, I started in January and I had to stop after my transplant for a little while. I'm back on it. Trulicity, which has worked very well for me. Um, there's, you know, uh, long acting, short acting insulin. Um, there's now even, you know, um, those, uh, you know, um, blood sugar machines that you don't actually have to, um, 
you don't actually have to prick your finger anymore. You can put a patch on you and it, uh, and you read it with your phone, um, called Dexcom or, um, uh, I forget the other one. Um, but, um, and my brother uses the Dexcom one and he swears by it. Um, but, um, there's also the pills. I was on Glipizide for a while, which is my understanding. That's kind of an old school pill. Uh, but it seemed to help me out for a little while. Uh, the big thing is, you know, if you're required to take medicine, just take it. Uh, I know it's frustrating to have to, like, I have to check my blood sugar four times, take, you know, five shots a day or something like that. And it drives me crazy, but it's super important to do it. Um, so, um, kind of last thing I want to kind of wrap up by talking about a little bit is, uh, what, what are the costs of diabetes? So we've talked about the cost of life with just the greatest cost. We've talked about the cost of, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, people getting sick with kidney disease and my eye problem and my stomach problem, that kind of thing. But let's talk a little bit about the actual costs to the U S uh, for, for, um, for diabetes. Um, so, uh, it looks like in the, in the year of 2017, there was $327 billion total cost of diagnosing diabetes in the United States or of diagnosed diabetes in the United States. Um, 237 billion of it were for direct medical costs and 90% was because of reduced productivity, uh, which is interesting to think about, you know, people when they're sick, get less done. And so it affects the economy a tremendous amount when you have, um, when you have people that are diabetes, diabetics and are having trouble and things like that. Um, so when you adjust for the population, age and sex differences, average medical expenditures among um, people with diagnosed diabetes were two to three, two point three times higher than expenditures would be if in the absence of diabetes. So we talked about one percent of the United's budget uh, is um, is spent on kidney disease, um, and I don't have the statistic, um, but but think about this: think of how much of the U.S. budget is spent on diabetes. Think about how much of the U.S. economy is spent on diabetes. Um, you know, you have, you have so many, you have so many companies, whether it be, you know, if you try to buy diabetic test strips, they're really expensive without insurance. If you tried to buy, um, uh, you know, see all the blood sugar machine companies, you see all the different diabetes medicine companies, you see, um, you see all the hospitals with diabetes floors and clinics and things like that. The amount of money yet again, it's about 30, 37 billion, $327 billion a year. And we talked about it on kidney disease. There's four. Um, there's forty about forty seven billion dollars spent a year. So think about that. The amount you know that's you know we're talking you know seven times the amount spent on diabetes, whether it be loss of production or just actual you know expenditures and things like that from it. So you know the big thing um, to kind of wrap up uh, with uh, this particular topic for today. Yet again, we'll get back to it again sometime. Is um, is, you know, definitely if you see the signs, yet again, if you're, you know, urinating constantly, if you have dry mouth constantly, uh, even sleep trouble, if you have blurry vision, uh, if you have, uh, you know, there's various different signs, definitely get checked out. If you talk to someone, get checked out. What's the worst that could happen? They say, no, it's not from diabetes. And they look into what else it is. Um, it's a serious disease. And, you know, I'm so lucky that as of now, it's not going to take my life, but who knows one day it might. Um, and it's just because I didn't think it would affect me. So please get checked out. If you love someone, tell them, uh, talk to them about the signs, talk to them about getting checked. Even people that are healthy. Uh, I know people that are healthy that still, when they get their yearly checkup, they make sure they get their A1C checked just because they want to make sure it's, um, it's in the normal range. So, so definitely everyone get checked out. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned some things. If not, you know, uh, I hope I, I uh, maybe inspire you to go look up some more things and, and figure out more about diabetes and things like that. Yet again, my, my email address is just K-E-N-S-O-R-E-N at AOL.com. If you want to send me an email about a topic, uh, you know, something like that, that you'd like me to cover, I'd love to research it. Also, um, you can find me on Facebook at Kenneth Sorensen, uh, S-O-R-E-N-S-O-N. Um, I love to hear from you and I hope uh, everyone learns some things and um, next week, I'm still trying to decide what I'm doing just because uh, I'm kind of having to cause, call an audible because uh, I was going to have a guest, but I don't think I'm going to be able to. So I'm still working on figuring out what I'm going to do for next week. But uh, yet again, anyone has any ideas, send them to me. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Um, and 
I guess that would be what the 27th. I'll see you guys then. And I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Bye.